In this final lecture on metabolism, we're going to look at the uh, what's called the absorptive and the post-absorptive state. And we'll look at how the neuroendocrine system, your nervous system and hormones, regulate metabolism. I'll uh, review quickly again the, the main functions of insulin, and then we'll look at the regulation of total body metabolism, body weight, and body heat. Okay, there's a couple of definitions we need to look at first before we talk about general metabolism here, and that is the difference between the absorptive versus the post-absorptive state. Absorptive state is when you are um, absorbing all of the nutrients you just ate in the diet. So you're still picking up glucose and amino acids and whatnot from the intestines. Um, the average meal takes between two and four hours to be fully absorbed. Uh, shorter if you have a high carbohydrate diet, longer if you're gonna have more fat and uh, protein in the diet. Um, but up to maybe four hours, you're getting absorption in that state. Um, basically absorption, think of that state as uh, you're storing and uh, you're synthesizing storage molecules for that food. So basically uh, it's the carbohydrates which provide most of the energy during that time. Um, the liver is gonna take up all the glucose it's going to use some of that for energy. It's going to store up uh, glycogen uh, from that. And uh, the adipose tissue also will tend to take up that glucose and will make actually through lipogenesis make more fat. So think of the glucose as being stored up as fat as well in the body. Um, there's a little bit of protein synthesis, um, and, um, but uh, that's going to happen usually later. Okay, so that's the absorptive state. Post-absorptive state, um, this is when there's no further absorption of nutrients from the GI tract, but we of course have to keep a steady concentration of glucose and amino acids and everything else in the blood. And the liver is a major organ that's gonna kick in to regulate all of this in the post-absorptive state. Um, basically, the synthesis of glycogen, fat, and protein ceases, and we're gonna go into catabolism of these things to try to maintain plasma glucose. Via the breakdown of glycogen, via glycogenolysis, breakdown of fat via beta oxidation and so forth. Um, the Again, glycogen fat protein synthesis is decreased. We have a net breakdown that occurs. Uh, glucose is formed in the liver via gluco, uh, glycogenolysis as well as gluconeogenesis. Uh, body meta metabolism shifts into protein sparing. So again, this is happening usually after four hours uh, after eating. And then the lipolysis uh, releases fatty acids. They're used uh, as energy, as beta oxidation, and the liver, they can be converted into ketones. So we make a little bit of ketones during that time as well. We go into a little bit of ketosis. Uh, and the brain and the nervous system can start using those ketones for energy. So that's the post-absorptive state. Now fasting starts to occur after not eating for 24 hours and the catabolic state just continues. So we go more and more into ketosis at that point, as well as gluconeogenesis. Um, so that's gonna be our two major energy systems. And at this point, the uh, hormones switch. So if you look at the absorptive state, we generally see that that's characterized by high insulin, especially if you eat carbohydrates in the diet, that's what's gonna stimulate insulin, and low glucagon, and low epinephrine. So that's the absorptive state. So people usually feel calmer after eating. That lowers your epinephrine, your stress hormone, so you don't feel quite wired as much anymore. And that's why some people overeat. They feel like they have to constantly eat to kind of uh, quell their anxiety. Versus in the post-absorptive state, we're gonna get low insulin, and now the glucagon levels go up, as well as the epinephrine levels go up. So you feel a little more anxious maybe in that post-absorptive state. But again, we're going from absorptive, more anab anabolic state into a more catabolic state. And uh, if we go into fasting, that continues even further. So those are the three energy states we're going to need to know about. So let's look at the absorptive period of metabolism. What happens to carbohydrates, triglycerides, and proteins during this state? Uh, again, our absorbed carbohydrates will be primarily glucose, galactose and fructose will be converted in the liver to glucose, and uh, the glucose can be used for energy, it can be stored as glycogen, and that's going to happen in the liver or skeletal muscle. Uh, also happens in cardiac muscles, so the, the heart can store up glycogen as well. Um, and then it can also be stored as fat, anything that's not needed for the first two, and that's going to happen in the liver and in adipose tissue.
Um, so in the liver, the glucose again could be used for energy, stored as glycogen, converted to fatty acids. And again, that's gonna be packaged into VLDL, which then carries the triglycerides out to tissues and it will become smaller and denser, becoming LDL rich in cholesterol. Um, there is an enzyme I mentioned found on the endothelial cell membranes in tissues, and that's called lipoprotein lipase. And that's actually the enzyme that's gonna cleave fatty acids from the triglycerides in VLDL. And that's how we're gonna get fatty acids moving from the VLDL into the tissues. And then the fatty acids will diffuse in the adipose tissue and they combine there with glycerol to form the triglycerides. Uh, so that's in the liver. In adipose, glucose uh, is gonna be converted into fatty acids and glycerol and stored as triglycerides or used as energy. Skeletal muscle, the glucose will be used as energy. Um, and uh, this is a major consumer actually of glucose, even at rest. And that's why the more muscle mass you have, the better you'll actually burn off your carbohydrates after a meal. Um, and uh, it can be stored as glycogen there as well. And then almost all tissues will use glucose as energy via glycolysis, the Krebs and oxidative phosphorylation. Again, that's anaerob or aerobic metabolism. Um, and we get carbon dioxide, water, and energy as a result. So that's the fate of glucose in those different tissues. In terms of triglycerides, remember dietary triglycerides will enter circulation as chylomicrons, special type of lipoprotein that was produced in the intestinal enterocytes. Um, they enter the lymph and systemic circulation, and then endothelial lipoprotein lipase will, just like we saw with VLDL, will cleave out the fatty acids from the triglycerides, and those will enter into the tissues, um, where they'll recombine to form usually triglycerides in the tissues and are stored, uh, especially in adipose. A minor amount will be metabolized for energy. Uh, now, uh, important point here is that adipose actually needs uh, to use glucose to make glycerol, uh, which of course is gonna be the backbone of triglycerides. So that's another role for glucose is not just uh, manufacturing more fatty acids, but also to make the glycerol that's needed for triglycerides. Um, so basically there are three main sources now of adipose in tri uh, of triglycerides and adipose. They can come from glucose, they can come from fatty acids that were made in the liver via VLDL transport, or they can come from your ingested uh, triglycerides via chylomicrons. And so that's how we get triglycerides into adipose. And I think for a lot of people that are over consuming calories, uh, the concern is that all of those are being, you know, especially if there's a lot of carbohydrate in there, all that glucose is being made in the liver primarily to fatty acids uh, or synthesized directly in the uh, adipose tissue into triglyceride. So that's the fate of absorbed triglycerides. In terms of absorbed amino acids, um, really uh, amino acids are not really stored in protein. Uh, they're just used to replace the lost pool of any amino acids. So there's a constant pool of amino acids in the blood, in the body. Um, some amino acids enter the liver cells. They're used to synthesize the various liver proteins as I talked about. Uh, they can be converted to the alpha keto acids via that deamination process we reviewed in the last video. Uh, and then the amino acids, amino groups can be used to synthesize urea. And the alpha keto acids can be, can enter the Krebs cycle and the TCA cycle. And so they can be metabolized for energy in liver cells, or they can be converted to fats. And so I didn't mention that earlier that we can actually convert the alpha keto acids from amino acid catabolism into fats. Um, most of the amino acids though will enter other cells where they're going to be used to synthesize proteins. So amino acids kind of get into the blood. Uh, some of them are used up in the liver, but a lot just goes into the systemic circulatory pool of amino acids. And that's going to deliver uh, amino acids to cells for protein synthesis. So th that's the summary of what happens to carbohydrates, triglycerides, and amino acids in the absorptive state. So after four hours or so after eating, we go into the post-absorptive state. And how is it that we maintain our blood sugar? Well, it happens in three primary ways. One is via breakdown of glycogen in the liver. That's called glycogenolysis. And the glycogen is uh, uh, basically broken down into glucose 6-phosphate. 
And that happens via a combination so the glycogen actually combines with water and there are different enzymes that actually cleave off the individual glucose units and we get glucose 6-phosphate. Now the liver can remove that phosphate group and then the glucose enters the blood. So the liver can supply blood sugar from the glycogen. And that's gonna be stimulated by the epi and the glucagon. Should mention that here, glucagon. And uh, this can supply the blood glucose for several hours. I mentioned, you know, five, six, seven hours. Some estimates go much further, but usually a few hours after that. So let's say you ate your last meal at uh, 6 p.m. Again, it takes about four hours to absorb all of that. Um, and uh, so we're in the absorptive state for up to four hours after that, so by 10 p.m. And then after 10 p.m., we're switching into the post-absorptive state, and the liver glycogen should supply your blood sugar for the next few hours. So until dawn, until breakfast, basically. Uh, unfortunately, in some people, um, if the liver has not stored up enough glycogen, come one, two, three in the morning, your blood sugar is gonna fall precipitously because the liver is not supplying the glycogen. And in order to uh, make new sugar, we essentially stimulate gluconeogenesis. So gluconeogenesis would be the liver's backup uh, if, if the glycogen supply runs out to now make new blood sugar, new glucose to be put into the, uh, the bloodstream. And that's gonna of course require those substrates of either uh, lactate, uh, glycerol or amino acids, um, and that can provide a fair amount of glucose, and that's going to really, gluconeogenesis is very active during fasting, um, but it can happen even at night if your glycogen stores run out. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this requires, again, glucagon, so as your blood sugar falls, glucagon levels go up, together with epinephrine. So you might wake up at one or two in the morning very alert, very anxious, and that is because your blood sugar fell too much because the liver essentially ran out of glycogen. Now, why did it run out of glycogen? Um, that has to do with the fact that, again, between 3 a.m. and 3 p.m., or uh, sorry, 3 p.m. and 3 a.m., the liver really should be in an anabolic phase where it's storing up glycogen. So we should live our lives in a way to be more rested, more, uh, say, yin, more focusing on anabolism in the later part of the day. Uh, if you encourage a lot of catabolic activities, you go to the gym too late, you are really active in the latter part of the day, uh, and so forth, you're going to encourage essentially a catabolic mode. And as a result, the liver won't be able to store up enough blood sugar. If you have high catecholamines, high stress hormone, uh, during that latter part of the day, the liver might be inhibited from making enough glycogen. And then come one to two in the morning, you're waking up wide awake because you ran out of glycogen and the liver is switching to gluconeogenesis. So that's, that's one source of plasma glucose, is by glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. Now skeletal muscle I mentioned can store up their own glycogen, but that glycogen can only be used when it's broken down into glucose can only be uh, used for local energy in the muscle. And uh, if the muscle is using a lot of energy anaerobically, it's gonna create lactate, and that lactate will then have to go back to the liver via the so-called Cori cycle, where it can be converted back to glucose via gluconeogenesis. All right, so that's the uh, uh, one source of plasma glucose. Another source that can happen, and this happens usually with more prolonged fasting, so going into not just post-absorptive, but going actually into a fasting state, would be lipolysis. And that's where adipose triglycerides are catabolized into glycerol and fatty acids. And then the uh, glycerol and fatty acids enter the bloodstream. And the liver, that glycerol can be converted back to glucose. And so that could be another source of glucose for the body. And of course, the fatty acids can be used via beta oxidation for energy needed. Um, a third source of uh, plasma glucose during the post-absorptive state would be from protein catabolism. And that's going to be the minor source, but that can occur a few hours into the post-absorptive state. And the tissue proteins break down into amino acids, which then travel to the liver. And the liver then converts some of them into the alpha-keto acids uh, via the uh, transamination. And then uh, they can be converted to back to glucose. So we can break down muscle proteins and whatnot to maintain blood sugar via that pathway. And that, again, is gonna happen more in prolonged fasting. So this is um, your three 
primary uh, sort of ways in which plasma glucose is maintained uh, in the post-absorptive state. Now, several hours into the post-absorptive state and going into the fasting state, uh, we, we have a shift in metabolism that actually works to spare glucose. It's called glucose sparing. So the normal energy expenditure for an adult uh, at rest is about 1,500 to 3,000 kilocalories per day. Um, gluconeogenesis can only supply about 700 or so uh, kilocalories per day, so less than half of that. Um, can be supplied via gluconeogenesis. So how, uh, so what happens then? Your blood sugar is going to start dropping, and uh, so the body goes into this glucose sparing, where basically the brain, which needs a lot of glucose, um, will be the primary utilizer of your glucose, and your other organs will shift to using ketone bodies. So, uh, or for fat breakdown, and of course, in the liver, when fats are broken down. We make all that acetyl-CoA, which is made into ketone bodies. So glucose-sparing uh, organs, uh, organs like the brain, the central nervous system, they will predominantly use your glucose. Other tissues will begin to rely on fat primarily for their energy source. And that comes from the triglycerides, and they're going to be broken down to acetyl-CoA uh, via beta-oxidation to acetyl-CoA. In the liver, most of that acetyl-CoA that's broken down from fatty acids won't go into the Krebs cycle again. It's going to go to make ketone bodies. And those are going to go out and uh, provide uh, nutrition to many tissues, including the brain. But again, the brain's going to continue to be the primary organ that's going to use your glucose into the fasting state. Um, so the ketones will significantly reduce the burden on gluconeogenesis. It'll also spare, you know, remember one of the sources of gluconeogenesis is amino acids. And so it's going to spare the breakdown of protein in your muscles and whatnot. So that's a uh, an important safety valve there is forming ketones. Um, it's interesting that after one month of fasting, uh, for people who fast for more than 30 days, the plasma glucose levels only go down by about 25%. So that's how well the body can maintain those glucose levels. And again, it, it's going to do that by shifting the energy uh, utilization in your tissues primarily towards ketone bodies with the exception of the brain. So the brain will continue to use glucose, but your other tissues will use fats primarily, uh, and then the ketone bodies resulting from fatty acid oxidation. So I've already talked about this before many times, so I'll just kind of summarize that what is it that really controls the balance between your anabolic versus catabolic state? Really, it's the neuroendocrine system. So your nervous system and your hormones. Um, and the major controls would be the hormones insulin and glucagon, which come from the pancreas, the beta and the alpha cells respectively in the islets of Langerhans, um, epinephrine from your adrenal medulla, and cortisol from your adrenal cortex, and then your sympathetic nervous system, uh, the nerves that go to the liver and the adipose tissue. Um, so looking at the hormones, remember that insulin is the primary driver of anabolism. It's secreted in large amounts during the absorptive state, especially if there's, you know, it's secreted when there's carbohydrate glucose in the diet. Uh, if you have a low carb diet, uh, high protein, high fat, even in the absorptive state, you won't get a lot of insulin. Um, so the insulin really uh, comes in because of the glucose in the diet. Uh, but generally it's gonna be increased in the absorptive state and decreased in the post-absorptive state. And the metabolic effects of insulin are primarily exerted on muscle cells. So muscle needs insulin to get glucose into them. Remember, those are insulin-dependent glucose transporters. Uh, and that would include uh, skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, as well as adipose tissue. So adipose tissue needs uh, insulin to get glucose into it. And then liver cells. Now, liver cells don't need insulin to get the glucose into them, but they need insulin to trigger all those different enzymes like making glycogen and, and so forth. Uh, so the storage of glycogen needs uh, and is, uh, needs uh, insulin. Um, so that's the general effects there. So if you look at increased plasma insulin in muscles, that encourages glucose uptake and utilization. Uh, that in encourages glycogen synthesis. And uh, these are the enzymes, so it upregulates glycogen synthase, it downregulates glycogen phosphorylase. Uh, it's going to increase amino acid uptake and protein synthesis. In adipose, insulin is going to increase glucose uptake and utilization, as well as lipogenesis. Uh, 
it's going to increase fatty acid and triglyceride synthesis. In the liver, it increases glucose uptake. Um, it's going to uh, increase uh, glycogenesis, so making new glycogen. Uh, it's also going to increase lipogenesis, making new fatty acids, as well as cholesterol synthesis. Remember, we talked about that. And it's going to inhibit ketone synthesis. So that's going to be the effects of increased insulin. Decreased insulin will cause in muscle a decrease in glucose uptake, increased uh, breakdown of the glycogen, glycogenolysis, increased release of amino acids, and increased protein catabolism. It's also going to cause the uh, increased, of, uh, uh, decreased, uh, increased fatty acid uptake and utilization. So in low insulin states, uh, skeletal muscle will take up fatty acids and will, you know, will kind of burn that for energy via, via beta oxidation. Uh, in adipose tissue, uh, decreased insulin is going to cause decreased glucose uptake and a net triglyceride catabolism. And basically glycerol and fatty acids will be released. And then in the liver, decreased insulin is going to cause more glucose to be released, going to cause glycogenolysis, uh, gluconeogenesis, and increased ketone synthesis and release. So this is our main hormone to regulate anabolism. We could say that the uh, insulin has a very yin-like effect on tissues. It causes storage of energy and decrease, ener decrease insulin, we're going to get the opposite effects. All right, so that's insulin. Now, again, the control of insulin secretion is primarily uh, plasma glucose. So eating glucose in the meal is your primary trigger for insulin release. Um, but other factors would be some amino acids, um, if they get elevated after meal, can also, like after high protein meals, can increase insulin secretion. And then there's hormones released from the lining of the small intestine when they sense glucose. And we talked about, uh, we have actually talked about these with the pancreas. Uh, so we have the so-called incretins, so the glucose-dependent insulin, insulinotropic peptide, GIP, um, that's released from the small intestine enteroendocrine cells in response to food in the small intestine, uh, food containing glucose. So there's GIP and there's also GLP-1. So these are the incretins. And then the final thing that regulates insulin would be your autonomic nervous system. Basically, the parasympathetic system, when it's activated, will encourage insulin secretion. Your sympathetic or fight or flight response will encourage more catabolism and inhibit insulin secretion. So those are the main regulators of insulin secretion. So what are the hormones that counter the effects of insulin? Well, again, glucagon is one of the main ones. And that acts mainly on the liver. Unlike insulin that works on the liver and skeletal muscle, uh, and adipose, um, glucagon works mainly in the liver and basically opposes the effects of insulin and it's going to cause the liver to break down glycogen, increase gluconeogenesis, so it's going to try to raise blood glucose, whereas insulin tries to decrease blood glucose. Uh, so this will be raised during hypoglycemia. Um, epinephrine, as well as norepinephrine from your sympathetic nervous system, but epi from your adrenal medulla is going to be increased in um, a... Uh, uh, post-absorptive state, when your blood sugar starts to fall, uh, we'll see increases of that. And then cortisol also, this plays a role in stress responses. We can say it kind of uh, augments the effects of epinephrine. And so we um, can see in cortisol deficiency states, uh, more tendency towards severe hypoglycemia. Uh, and there's a condition where we have true adrenal fatigue, that's known as Addison's disease, where the immune system uh, attacks the adrenal gland. It's an autoimmune disease, just like autoimmune thyroiditis, and causes severely low cortisol, and it can actually be fatal uh, because of the severe resulting hypoglycemia and low blood pressure that results from that too. Um, and uh, cortisol, uh, so cortisol is needed uh, to, to essentially maintain your blood sugar. Um, but too much cortisol over time can actually induce insulin resistance, which is a whole nother problem we'll talk about with the diabetes section. Finally, growth hormone promotes growth and protein anabolism. Um, its overall effects seem to oppose those of insulin. It's most predominant during early life, uh, during in children uh, and, and up to teens. We have a lot of growth hormone being secreted and that kind of works opposite to insulin, but it keeps you slim, everything else. So we think that you know growth hormone actually has an effect of, again, opposing insulin, 
poses that storage of fat and so forth is causing breakdown of fat, but it increases protein uh, anabolism, buildup of you know, connective tissue and, and bone and so forth. Um, so some people are saying, well, why don't we use for adults if we have lower growth hormone? In adults, growth hormone is primarily released only during deep sleep, during slow wave sleep, and that's only for about 10 or 15 minutes, maybe one, two or three times a night, we get these pulses of growth hormone. Um, unfortunately, if you inject yourself with growth hormone, uh, you run the risk of actually developing diabetes. It, uh, growth hormone will tend to raise your blood sugar, uh, it raises blood pressure as well, and uh, so this can actually contribute to type 2 diabetes. So it has an anti-insulin effect, but it can create sort of an insulin-resistant-like state. Um, okay, so that's the main hormones that oppose the actions of insulin. So I just put a little checklist in terms of what they do in terms of glycogenolysis, uh, gluconeogenesis, lipolysis, and so forth. And that's kind of what we've already discussed. So I won't go through that. So finally, I'll just say a few words about how biomedically we think about the regulation of total body energy and metabolism. Um, this is basically the idea of the calories. So calories in equal calories out. I know there's you know, a lot of controversy about this because all these other hormones play such a role in regulating this. So it's not always that simple. Um, but if we just start with the basics, we'd say that, you know, energy is of course equal to heat as well as the work, uh, that's produced. And, uh, the work in the case of the body would be external work, like through your skeletal muscles or your internal work of your organ processes and so forth. So the total body energy is equal to the heat plus all that internal and external work. Um, total energy expenditure is equal to the internal heat produced plus the external work performed, plus the energy that's stored. So that's gonna be the equation for your total body expenditure. For body weight to remain stable, according to this way of thinking, total energy expenditure must equal total energy intake. So calories in, equal calories out. Um, so energy stored, equal energy from food intake, minus the internal heat produced and the external work that's produced. Um, the stored energy is usually in the form of adipose uh, tissue. So basically we store energy as uh, in triglycerides, which store up in adipose tissue. Now the metabolic rate um, is basically the total energy expenditure over time. And how do we measure energy? We measure it through calories. So calorie is just the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one liter of water by one degree Celsius. A killer calorie is 1000 calories. So for body, uh, you know, energy requirements, we usually talk about kilocalories. Um, and we sometimes use the word calorie with a capital C to signify a kilocalorie. I know that's confusing, um, but when you see big C calorie, that means uh, kilocalorie, which is 1,000 calories. Uh, and again, a calorie is the amount of heat that it takes to raise the temperature of one liter of water, one degree Celsius. So total body energy expenditure in through time in a unit of time is our metabolic rate and our basal metabolic rate is the is the metabolic rate under basal or resting conditions so at rest comfortable in a post absorptive state and what determines your bmr or basal metabolic rate are essentially four different things one is the activity of your thyroid hormone so thyroid basically helps mitochondria function better that makes them increase their oxygen consumption. So it's gonna increase the beta oxidation, the burning of the foods, increase Krebs cycle, oxfos, and so forth. And so we call this a calorigenic effect. So thyroid hormones basically cause your tissues to utilize energy more, uh, 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 more rapidly and to create more heat as a result of that. Uh, epinephrine is another one, the, another hormone from the adrenal medulla. And we saw that stimulates glycogen and triglyceride catabolism. Uh, there is something called food-induced thermogenesis, which is where food ingestion actually increases your metabolic rate by about 10 to 20% for a few hours after eating. Um, and uh, most in this results in a lot of heat, and that's from the processing of these nutrients to the liver. But then it rapidly drops. So this is a temporary effect. But one of the biggest kind of long-term determinants is gonna be your muscle activity. So increases in skeletal muscle activity dramatically increase your metabolic rate. Uh, and the more skeletal muscle mass you have, uh, 
the higher your BMR at rest is going to be. Um, and so we see with muscle activity, an increase in energy expenditure from about 1,500 kilocalories in 24 hours to more than 7,000 kilocalories in 24 hours, like in athletes and things like that. So this is why we encourage creating not just you know muscle activity, but encouraging muscle mass through muscle building activities. Um, the more muscle you have, again, the higher your, your BMR is at rest and the less uh, extra energy you'll store is triglycerides and fat tissue and so forth. Again, many factors uh, related to the hypothalamus and whatnot have a additional regulatory role here. I'm not going to get into that just yet, uh, but these are the, in the very simplified level, the basic determinants of basal metabolic rate. Okay, so that wraps it up for metabolism. So hopefully you get a better idea now about how the different foodstuffs are used at the cellular level, how body energy uh, is related to that, and the different hormones and the neuroendocrine regulation of uh, body energy and metabolism, how all that occurs.